Hey, you're listening to a Bible Bro Down podcast, a member of the Trinity Commission. This is where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. So today, the plan is to talk about something that's not related to basically anything else we've talked about. Um, and we're going to talk about the times of ignorance. In Acts 17, God, Paul says that God has overlooked the times of ignorance, and we wanted to know more accurately what that was. Right? Yeah, because yeah, we've actually had this question. I think I've, I've received it only a couple of times in our discussions with people about the universal witness and and uh, and us saying that all people have always known that you know God witnesses to them so they can know him, they can turn to turn from their sin and to trust in him. They can humble themselves, fear him, fall on his mercy. Uh, and people have said, well, yeah, but what what is what does times of ignorance mean then in Acts 17? He's, it says that you know, he's now commanding all people everywhere to repent. And uh, does that mean that he wasn't commanding them to do that before or something? Right, right. And uh, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at um, uh, where else in Scripture we get an idea of what this these times of ignorance were. And we're going to look at how God commands everybody to repent now. So it mm-hmm. uh, should be cool. Um, the mini for this week is also going to tie in. We're going to talk about Old Testament saints and, and whether or not they had to be... Um, rejuvenated or regenerated prior to them believing and what that looked like. So we've got a clip we're going to play from a, a, a debate or two uh, that'll that'll uh, help us talk through that as well. So anything you want to yeah. say before we jump in? Nope. I think we're we're good to go. Ready. Good to go. Okay. Well, then uh, turn with... So where did this times of ignorance come from? What? <laughs> I, said, I said, so where does this whole time of ignorance come from? Uh, you mean like what chapter and book? Yeah. Acts, uh-huh. <laughs> Acts 17. I'll tell you what, I'll read the whole thing and then, uh, we can back up and you can start us at like what? The whole chapter? 22. No, we don't read whole chapters, <laughs> Billy. We only read like. You don't read very well at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do words. Okay. That's a lot. I know. <laughs> um, all right, let me start at 22. I'll read through about, uh, verse 31, something like that. And then you can back us up and, and start explaining what's going on here. Not good. Sounds good. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observed that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the, the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made, by, made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of all the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries uh, of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far off from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then children of God, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, stone, an image formed by the uh, art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So that's that's the what's going on here, and I guess I could back up a little bit and say that Paul was in the marketplaces of Athens reasoning with people and, and explaining to them uh, the gospel and some of the, the the Greeks in Athens being uh, lovers of wisdom and new thought and oh, argument, frankly, <laughs> grabbed him and said, hey, why don't you come with us to the Areopagus, to this place where new ideas are presented, where it's debated, where people are, are always thinking <laughs> and they uh, come with us over here and and explain your thought to the, these uh, learned people. And so that's what Paul that's what Paul's doing here. Mars here. Bleh, Mars Hill. Uh, Ares, Apagus, that's Ares is Mars, that's the god of war. Um, that's where he is, the Areopagus. So. Yeah, um, so in, in the midst of this, you know, he's in the midst of this, and around there, there were all these objects of worship, and uh, I don't know where you got this from, Matt, in the notes, but you said there were around 3,000 statues of various gods that the Greeks worshipped. Yeah, throughout Athens. I think that's a... That's a uh, secular historical fact. I don't think that's in scripture, mm-hmm. but it, it's a. Uh, there are, there were thousands of them. 
I should just say that. A lot. And, and so in the midst of, of all of these statues, you know, uh, Hermes and Zeus and Athena and, and all those things, was this altar that had an inscription, the unknown God. And, and what does Paul say there? Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. This I I make known to you. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. So is is in this therefore what you worship in ignorance. So Matt, does this mean that these people were worshiping God? Uh, it depends. I mean, so I would say I think there are three pretty solid options for what Paul means by uh, what you worship in ignorance. Uh, the first option is that the Greeks were, were actually worshiping God, uh, the Maker of heaven and earth. I am Yahweh. They were worshiping Him. Um, but they didn't know his name, so they just they put up this statue uh, in reverence to God. And while that seems plausible, just just right here in verse twenty three, you know maybe that's what he means. I think by the time we get to the end of this little discourse, uh, it's it's pretty solidly refuted. There's these people were not all listening and hear, uh, hearing and learning from the Father. They were not worshiping God because by the end. And I didn't read that, actually. It's a couple more verses. They, uh, they hear about the resurrection, and most of them turn away. Well, if they, didn't, mm-hmm. if, they didn't, if they weren't drawn to Christ, then they weren't hearing and learning from the Father. So they were not worshiping God. But, right. But we do need to also, verse 33. So, so, so Paul went out of their midst because when, he, when it says they basically, some began to sneer, you know, basically ridicule him for what he was saying. Uh, and, and, and they didn't want to hear anything else he had to say. Kind of like what happens today. Uh, and it says, so Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Right. There were some there who, who uh, received his message. Uh, the second main option, I think, for this uh, worshiping in ignorance is uh, that the Greeks were basically superstitious. They had 3,000 or whatever the number was, statues to various gods around the city. And just in case they might have missed one, they put up another <laughs> statue that was like, uh, I mean, it was, it was, uh, insurance. It was a backup. You know, what if, what if another God appears to them and they're like, oh, well, oh no, this is yours over here. Look, we just didn't know your name. So we put it to an unknown God. And, uh, Paul is using their superstition as a way to get the foot in the door. Look, you recognize Greeks that even though you have 3,000 other idols, you still need, there, there's something missing. And I'm telling you what it is you're missing. So they weren't necessarily worshiping God. They just had fire insurance in the form of an idol. And similar to that, um, the third option is that over time, one of them just wasn't taken care of or it was damaged in some way. And people forgot who this statue was to. I mean, you, you try to keep track of 3,000 different statues. It's bound to happen. Some, one of them's going to get broken or, or the weather is just going to wear off the name or something so they just leave it up just in case you know uh, we don't remember who this god is but he might get mad if we don't leave his little statue up so uh they just put two and unknown god and in the same way paul still uses it look you, you recognize that there's something out there that that you're missing probably um here's what it is so the, the option two and three he's using uh this statue and for whatever reason it's up as a foot in the door for him to to declare to them who God actually is. Yeah, it's uh, what's I watched. Uh, we went and watched the Apostle Paul movie, and one the uh, centurion uh, that was in charge of Paul at the prison. They, I thought it was interesting because the centurion has a sick daughter, and uh, this centurion has been sacrificing and doing all these things, all these to some gods. And he's talking to another friend of his who says, you know, well, have you sacrificed? He's like, yes, I've done it to this and this. He's like, well, that's a good thing about, you know, you know, the, the, the Greeks, or the, I, I guess at that point it was Rome, uh, is that, you know, if it's not, if it's not this God, you can sacrifice to this God. And, and he, and he lists like 10 other names that, that this guy could have sacrificed to. I mean, that's how, that's what they thought. And, and they thought that if you were to, at least according to the movie, if somebody were to turn to this, this Christ person, that it would offend the other gods. I think it's interesting when they had so many. <laughs> if, if you were worshiping one over the other, is the other one offended? Uh, what, what, what's the point? And I, I guess it's kind of interesting. What's a, how would you offend one if you added another when there's already 3,000 to follow? <laughs> because the one that they could have turned to, which was actually God, was part of Team Fake. 
So <laughs> that, yeah. that's what offended. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I need to see that movie, actually. Um, it's pretty good. Yeah. Out of mm-hmm. 10, what do you give it? Uh, I don't know. It's like, I don't. It's biblical. It's not like that kind of movie. <laughs> it was a great Christian movie. Yeah. Um, there was I, I, there was a very a lot of powerful scenes in it. You know that like teared you up, mm-hmm. and and there was like no words being spoken. It was just the scene and what's occurring and what you know is going on in everybody's heart, and there's just lots of that going on. And it's there's a lot of powerful moments. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> so there you go, people. Uh, recommendation for Billy. Um, yeah. Last football. time we recommended uh, Fudge and Hell or whatever it was, and I still haven't seen that. Where is that? <laughs> It's on Amazon Prime. Oh, I have that. Okay, cool. Uh, but we're right, getting off so, course. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so Acts 17, 24, uh, 25, it, you know, so after Paul kind of mentions this whole worshiping the ignorance and, and what we just explained, uh, that they were worshiping ignorance, what, what the possibilities were, he goes on to say, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Yeah. So this kind of goes with what you were saying about Matt, uh, with he got his foot in the door with coming to the statue and talking about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he says, hey, look, I see you got your superstitious, superstitious statue over here, uh, this, this just-in-case statue, uh, but let me tell you about the real God. He doesn't actually need anything. He, he made literally everything He's he's over everything, and uh, he he doesn't need you to build him a statue. He doesn't need you to serve him. Uh, he actually gives you life and breath and all things. So he's flipping the roles here from the basically what they're used to in their religious practices. Yeah, I think it's also interesting. So initially they started. Uh, uh, um, is it? They heard what he was saying initially in Athens. And he's a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. So Paul was already preaching Jesus in the resurrection, and they brought him in there. And it's interesting is that he doesn't turn to the, to Christ right away. He turns to God, like God the Father, God the Creator, God the uh, Lord of heaven and earth. And I think it's interesting that well, it's not until later that he ties he brings in Christ. So, you know, the God, he's, he, where he goes, you know, um, God is now declaring uh, to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day, still being the the God of the universe, the creator, right, in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man. So now, now he brings in Christ. I think it's interesting that this entire discourse, he's speaking of God in the, in the big general sense. Right. Yeah. He, he reasons from the triune God, to mm-hmm. a specific person of the Trinity. Yep. Or persons, because he's talking, yeah, he, he differentiates by the end. You're right. Uh, so verse 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live in all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your poets have said, for we are all his children. Um, This is... It's just building on the case he's already started, right, in 24 and 25. Look, he doesn't need you. He doesn't need your human hands to make him a statue. In fact, uh, he gives you life and breath and all things uh, to the extent that he made from one man every nation, including your little Greek nation. And he established their times and their boundaries for the specific purpose that they would seek him. Uh, and and I think here he's, he's trying to point them back. Look, uh, again, you recognize that you need something else. That's why you have this other statue up. These 3,000 aren't enough. You've got something else. God's purposefully established the boundaries and the time for your nation so that you would seek him. So you should be recognizing what it is. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then he promises that, look, if you grope for him, you'll find him because he's not far off. Uh, in fact, in him we live and move and exist. We, we are he's given us all things. There's no getting away from God. And, and even your own poets admit we're his children. And we probably also need to have a mini someday about distinguishing between the different ways we are his children, but. And his people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his sheep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I think it's interesting that. So Paul uses this foot in the door with the altar 
to start speaking to them of of again what they're worshiping in ignorance at least what, how, how paul explains it and then turns to their philosophers or their poets right and says that even your even your poets have said that we are his children yeah then uh he he continues the argument 29 being the children of god we ought to not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and thought of man <laughs> which means paul is just kind of a uh, uh dumping all over their three stat three thousand idols around the city mm-hmm. uh yeah no the actual god is isn't something that a, an artist can can make an image of which do, what, what's one of the uh ten commandments no graven image why because you can't capture God in that image. There's there's no way to to properly portray him. Yeah, so in these, I don't know, what is it, six or seven verses on how Paul goes on to... Because, to, again, it says uh, in verse... Uh, where is it? Verse 23. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So this is a summary of what he's now proclaimed to them about... The Lord of heaven and earth, the creator, the God who made all things. He says that there's one God who made the world and all is in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands. He is the one that gives all people life and breath in all things. He is the one that made from one man every nation of mankind on the face of the earth. He is the one that determined and appointed men and the nations, their boundaries, their habitation. The entire point of mankind is to seek God, to grow up for him and find him. He's not far from each one of us. In him we live and move and exist. Your poets recognize that we are God's children. So now being then children of God, don't think about his nature as something that you can capture in gold and silver or stone or art. Um, all that in that little discourse, he, he just proclaimed uh, all these things they, 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 they were ignorant of and he just proclaimed it to them. Yeah, so, so again, back to this, this understanding of ignorance. What, if they had been worshiping God... They didn't know these things. They they were not recognizing the ignorance that it took to cr- try to create a statue to him. Um, what does what does Paul say in verse thirty? Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men, uh, all people everywhere, that they should repent, because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. He's overlooking the times of ignorance, and declaring that people should repent. So, uh, Billy, what does it mean to overlook? I mean, from, from uh, in a theological perspective, when God overlooks something, what is he overlooking? Uh, not holding you accountable. For? The ignorance. <laughs> for your actions that were done in ignorance. And these, these things aren't like, oh, you, you did a really good job. I'm going to overlook that. He's overlooking sin, right? Right. This is stuff that they should not have been doing. Absolutely. This is where we're going to explore for the rest of the, the article is, what was it? So a, clearly the turning point is in verse 31. Uh, he, has, he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So you have ignorance, the times of ignorance. You have... Uh, proof furnished to all men by raising Jesus from the dead. And now you have God declaring to all people everywhere that they should repent. That's the turning point between the times of ignorance and the times of, we'll just call them the times of repentance, <laughs> the, the time of the church. Uh, so what, yeah, we're going to look at what it is that could have been going on in the times of ignorance and how it is that all men everywhere are being called to repentance. Yeah, that overlooked uh, is like in the King James. It, it it's winked. I'm sure people have, if you've had any co- theological conversations about this, people will bring up that because oftentimes people were raised with the King James, and you know God winked at those to overlook, to take no notice of, not to attend, uh, and that's that's what he was doing. Um, it, it's uh, basically from uh, to perceive with something, so he's not looking at it. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, a question we need to ask before we move on to other scripture and that'll clarify this. Um, Billy, uh, is is it only after Christ that men are supposed to repent? I mean, no. like it, you didn't have to repent as long as you're in the Old Testament, like Abraham didn't have to. Or... 
No, uh, it's it's repentance is spread throughout the entire Old Testament, and uh, we can see that there's a lot of God commanding Israel to repent. And people say, well, yeah, see, this is different. Now he's commanding all people everywhere to repent, not just Israel. Uh, first, first, that's not uh, all true. In Isaiah 45, 22, this is God speaking. He says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And he actually, uh, I'd like that full context of that. Let me pull it up real quick. Uh, it's really good. Uh, yeah, so for thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited, right? So that's exactly what Paul, right, has <laughs> just told these people, right? He's the creator of heavens. He's, he's the one that made it all and, and, and established it. That's exactly what Paul says to these guys. He says, I am Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in some dark land. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in a waste place. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, declaring things that are upright. So this is what... <clears throat> um, this see this understanding of who God is and the understanding of doing righteousness. And we know that righteousness only comes by faith. Uh, God is declaring that as, as we mentioned in our last episode, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare his righteousness. The heavens declare his loving kindness, all these things. Why, why is, are, are they declaring his righteousness? So we seek his righteousness. So we seek his glory. All right. And we do that through faith. <clears throat> um, so again, it's not in secret. He says, gather yourselves and come draw near the fugitives of the nations. Uh, they have no knowledge who carry out their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. So here again, we, we have some idol, idly, idols going on. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Wait. This is This is speaking to everyone here. <clears throat> well, when he says all the ends of the earth, does he mean all types of ends of the earth, maybe? <laughs> he means the four corners of the earth. Oh, flat earth theory. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> yeah, he wants the world to repent. Um, the, the the difference between what, what Isaiah is saying there, um, turn to him and be saved, the difference between that repentance and the repentance in Acts 17 is that God is now declaring to men, uh, excuse me, God, yeah, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent of what? Of worshiping it, worshiping him improperly during the times of ignorance. Right. So they, they, and I'm kind of giving it away, but we're talking about his sheep prior to Christ, possibly worshiping him the wrong way. And we're going to have examples of that versus his sheep after Christ being called to repent of those things and worshiping him properly. And we actually have a very good example of that in James, John 4. Yeah, before we get to that, uh, just another passage that speaks of, of God <coughs> witnessing and and uh, witnessing to people and getting them to turn uh, from their sin. Uh, Job thirty three. We've mentioned this again many times before about uh, God uh, bringing revelation to people. He gives revelation to people to turn a person from their sin and cover a person's pride. He spares a person's life from corruption. Right, so the entire point of his witness, of his revelation, of him calling them out, of him sending a messenger, is to turn them from their sin and restore them to righteousness. Right, to keep them from from the pit. So, what what does it mean to turn from your sin, Matt? What's another way of saying that? <laughs> to repent. Exactly. Uh, so, God has always called men to repent. When uh, you, I think an easy way to see this, um, Matt, just with like kind of like basic. You know, 101 common sense is that we have a law written on our hearts and our conscience when we do something wrong <laughs> bears witness against us why is it witnessing against us is it just for like giggles <laughs> right? what's the point of of our conscience uh fighting against us or hitting us in the head what is the point of that uh it's it's a goad right it's it's pointing <laughs> us to repent of that thing that you're doing that you know you shouldn't be doing and not do it <laughs> exactly. And ultimately, that that law in our heart is like any other law. It's meant to point to point out the fact that we are failures and point us to the grace of God. Yep. Ready for John? Yeah. So as, as Matt said, this when it says that now God is now commanding all people everywhere to repent. Uh, again, this yeah. isn't something that oh, repent and. Trust in God. It, it's not necessarily speaking of that. It's repent of how you are worshiping God, how you are worshiping in ignorance, and now worship Him in truth. 
And what what did Paul do here? He he gave them a list of all these truths. And now we're gonna we're gonna show that this is uh, against Matt said we're gonna go through the scripture that shows that yeah people were worshiping him in ignorance, mm-hmm. but he still accepted it. Yeah. So John <laughs> four twenty through twenty four just to set the stage a little bit. Uh, Jesus goes and sits down at the the well of Jacob or Jacob's well in uh, Sychar, Sychar, I don't know how to pronounce that, but he was a, uh, hey, this is where the Sumerian woman comes up and Jesus asks her for water and she is surprised that a Jew is asking her for water and they end up talking and uh, this is, he, he brings out the fact that she is uh, married to five people, not just one. And uh, he calls her on that and she's surprised. And uh, he tells her that, look, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would turn around and ask me for the water of uh what does he call it the water of life or the something like that anyway um so he is revealing to her th- that he is the messiah and in fact he just straight up tells her at one point uh but at verse 20 she's talking about worship and she's talking about the where the sumerians worshiped versus where the jews worshiped and and jesus corrects her on what god actually expects in worship so starting at 20 Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. So we just pause right there. You, Samaritan woman, are worshipping what you do not know. What's another way of saying that? You are worshipping in ignorance. (laughs) Uh, We, so continuing on, we worship what we know. Who is we? The Jews. The Jews worship what we know. Why? Because God has given them this revelation of who he is and all of these these laws and everything uh, to follow. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So there's there's a a wrong way that that the Sumerian people were doing it, that were worshiping him. It was it was an ignorance. Yes, were they worshiping God? Yeah, were they doing it right? Apparently not. Um, right. Yeah. It appears that from I've heard this taught before, and I, and this is how I see this too: is that they worshipped what you do not know. They worshipped in spirit, but not in truth. We it says as as he says, we worship what we know. We we have again, God gave them the truth. Is like. I'm gonna, I want you to create this temple. I want you to build this temple this way. You're going to have these priests. This is how you're going to serve me. This is what you're going to do. So that's that's what they were doing. Now, many of those Jews turned around and did that. They worshiped, quote unquote, in truth, but not in the spirit. They actually didn't do it from faith out of love. They did it just in truth. Whereas these Sumerians were worshiping by the spirit, but not in truth. And, and what we see is that God, it's not about worshiping in the truth. It's not about worshiping the spirit. He wants Everyone to be knowledgeable of how to worship and worship through the Spirit. You know, that reminds me of uh, <laughs> the end of Romans 9. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. One was pursuing it in the Spirit. One was pursuing just the truth. Uh, that's kind of what it sounds like there in John 4. Not exactly. But yeah, reminds me of it. And what's very interesting is this, that this ties to what Paul was saying in Acts 17 is that, again, the Jews, again, worshiping in the temple and with the priests and the Sumerians worshiping, quote unquote, by the spirit on the mountain. Right. And this is the very thing that Paul says. That's not how you worship God. He says that God isn't served in idols. Right. And isn't served in buildings made with hands or served by human hands well how did the jews quote unquote serve god they went through the process that he gave them in the the temple right Mm -hmm. serving him by human hands Mm -hmm. (laughs) so and people may think well yeah but that that was the truth and it absolutely was the truth but it was it was a teaching moment it was a shadow for for them yeah yeah and for us is that you know god was saying this is the temple i'm going to dwell in the temple you're going to serve me with with sacrifices right this was a teaching moment is that was that did god want them to do that yes that was the truth was uh what was it speaking of that we're the temple as as christ says you know destroy this temple and i'll raise in three days we are we are god's temple god uh, God dwells in us his spirit dwells in us we as priests of god serve him by submitting our will to his will and offering those as that that submission and fault and and allegiance and servitude through faith as sacrifices 
we offer daily sacrifices by serving God. So let, let me let me walk you through not you the, you the listener not you Billy <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, a, a train of thought uh, starting in John four. Jesus tells the woman that she's worshiping what she does not know, meaning that she worships in ignorance. Obviously, that's what that means. Um, and what was it the, that Paul told the Greeks they were doing? They were worshiping in ignorance. I can't talk in ignorance. What is it that God overlooked in Acts seventeen? He overlooked the times of ignorance. So this is this is referring to worship. Um, so it's it's pretty clear, just using these two passages, that there was a time in which God allowed people to worship Him in a physical way that wasn't necessarily right or appropriate for worshiping Him. That was something He was overlooking because they were ignorant of how they were supposed to worship. Um, these people could st- they could have still been credited with righteousness because of their faith, but they could have been doing it wrong. Uh, and as we pointed out in our Sins of Ignorance study, a, a person, God provides a payment, a sacrifice, for people who do sins in ignorance. It's only once that sin is pointed out that he expects them to repent and turn from whatever it was they were doing. So what is it that changed? What was the difference between then uh, when they were worshiping in ignorance compared to the time of Paul's writing when people should be repenting from that worship in ignorance. Um, the the turning point, not just Christ, but the turning point is the outpouring of the Spirit on God's people. The Holy Spirit mm-hmm. is the difference between then and now. Right. Prior to Christ, people were given the right to become children of God. Uh, if they received the word and they, and they followed the Lord in faith, they were justified by that faith, they were set apart in Christ, they were given the right to become children of God. But they had not yet received the spirit of truth within them to testify to them the freedom from these ignorant traditions by which they tried to please God. Mm-hmm. Now, does that mean the they were... covenant... Well, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, that, that doesn't mean, though, that they weren't... Uh, they didn't still have some idea of, of what God expected, right? That, that Absolutely. They just weren't... Yeah, and we'll get into that. I mean, well, you know, the, again, the Jews had... Uh, the the Mosaic Law and the prophets mm. to to teach them various truths that God wanted. <clears throat> That's and, and we could actually look at that as they were under guardian, right? They were under guardian until the time of the Holy Spirit right. in this new covenant. They were under guardianship. Well, what were what were Gentiles under? They had the law written on their hearts, Romans too. and they had their conscience, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, yeah, we will so get with, to that more. Yeah, the new covenant was ratified at the cross. The new covenant has with it the promised Holy Spirit. Ephesians one thirteen. In Him you also. After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are sons, so because you have trusted in God, you've been credit, you've been given the right to become a child of God, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So after Christ, the Father gave to everyone who is in Christ, uh, everyone who is in Christ, the spirit of his son, because we are seen as his children through Christ. So... <clears throat> Notice the order. Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. So you believe first, you are are accredited, you are put in Christ, and then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And then in Galatians 4, uh, because you are sons. Well, how is anybody a son? Because they're in Christ, and God sees us through Christ as one of his children. So you believe, you're in Christ, you are then sent the Spirit. That's important. It's a familial thing. Uh, God is sending his spirit to his family. Right. <clears throat> First John 5, 6 to 9 says, It is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he is testified concerning his son. So, Matt, what is this saying? Well, one of the rules of the of the spirit. I mean, there's there's multiple. We've talked about him, and, and we're gonna have. Uh, I'll go ahead and say this. We're gonna have a full study on uh, pneumatology, on what the spirit, the Holy Spirit, does in the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, how he's been working and moving among uh, all of the all, all people. And uh, so, this we're not gonna get into everything in this study. We just <laughs> we don't have time for that. That'll probably be a two part or two episode thing that we break down for y'all. Um, but one of the roles of the spirit, obviously based on first John five, 
through uh, six through nine is that he testifies about Jesus. He testifies concerning the Son, and and this is meant to teach us and convict us of the fact that we are sinning and outside of God's will when we are. Well, we'll, we'll get there, but when you consider the the understanding of the times of ignorance and and the fact that the the central point of which the times of ignorance goes away and we are now in a time of repentance is the Holy Spirit. What are people given? What are people who are following God given the Holy Spirit to tell them what you're doing and how you're worshiping is wrong? You need to be looking out for his son. And as soon as that son is presented, uh, all the people who are appointed to eternal life will believe. Just, it was Acts 16, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, you're talking about uh, those, uh, all people, that's Acts 13, 48. 13, yes. Uh, it, 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 that situation is exactly what we're talking about here. People are appointed to eternal life. Why? Because they're hearing and learning from the Father. They are, uh, the Spirit is given to them. And as soon as they hear about Christ, they recognize, as John 10 says, they recognize the voice of their shepherd and they accept him immediately. If they reject him, they were lying. Uh, that's in 1 John 1, actually. If they If they reject that light then they were the light was not in them right we there's all all sorts of passages that speak of of the trinity itself as uh, testifying of the other members you know uh john uh 537 uh and the father who sent me has testified of me you've neither heard his voice at, at any time or seen his form um J- uh, john 819 uh, so they were saying where is your father jesus answered you know you know neither me nor my father if you knew me then you would know my father also. Uh, where else do we have it? In John uh, 14, 7 and 9, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen my father, uh, he, has, he who has seen me has seen my father also. <clears throat> and he who hates me hates my father also. They all testify uh, about each other. John fifteen twenty six. this is speaking of the Spirit itself. When the Helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, this is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. And these are all passages, again, that uh, God, this, uh, Matt, we, I really want to have a study on also uh, the whole idea of God, a, a kingdom cannot be divided, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And and how that pertains to you know Christ uses it as a as saying that I can't be of Satan and then cast out you know Beelzebub right because a king can't divide it. We'll turn that around on on God's side right. The fa- and this is making me think of the story that we mentioned a couple episodes ago Matt about like the king we're in a kingdom we're sitting out on the outskirts of the kingdom and we've put allegiance to the king and uh, we we've only heard certain things from about the king and what he wants right and then. <clears throat> The, the, but the king has told us that, hey, um, I want you to obey my son. Well, we don't even know who the son is. We've never read the son, but I want you to obey this the son. Well, when the son comes and is speaking the same things as the father, if we truly have been listening to and and know who the king is, then when he sends his son, we're going to listen to and know the son because the king says, I want you to obey my son. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> the kingdom isn't divided. <clears throat> Dang, I can't talk. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. How are you protected from all the outside lands that are, that may come in and try to kill you uh, by by having allegiance to the kingdom? Yeah, you, you know the the father. Okay, you pledge allegiance to the father, and you'll be revealed the son. If you if the prince is out, and you, you are presented the prince first, and then you come to understand the the father and how he has been working. Okay, well then you'll accept the father uh, after the fact. It, you are pledging allegiance to the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. And then the specifics will work themselves out. You'll be, uh, as John fourteen twenty six says, by the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance uh, all that I said to you. So this is talking to the disciples, obviously, and helping them remember what he was. they were taught. Uh, John sixteen thirteen. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. John sixteen eight. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Uh, 1 John 2, 20... Yeah, First John two twenty seven. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. This anointing, you are anointed by the Spirit. You, when you are pledging allegiance to the kingdom, 
after Christ came and died and was resurrected, you are baptized into the Son, you are seen as family, you are given the Holy Spirit, and he will direct you in all truth. You will be convicted. So like, Billy, if, if let's, give, let's say you have someone who's a, a Muslim, and they are, as Acts 17 puts it, uh, groping in the darkness. They, they're going through the motions for Islam, but they recognize that it's wrong somehow. They, 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 they're seeking God, and he reaches out to them. Uh, is the spirit going to allow that Muslim to stay in Islam or is he going to pull that Muslim out of that? Uh, he's going to pull them out. You know, as Matt said, so uh, the spirit convicts and teaches of the son and another role is to teach us all things. This is again, that thing that they didn't have in the old Testament. The spirit was not in them and dwelling them, teaching them all things. They had ignorance because they didn't have the spirit teaching them. They were under the law, the written law and the prophets. That's all they had. These were guardians and caretakers, so to speak, until the spirit came, until uh, the law, the, the true law of God is written on our hearts that and, can, and he is in the world convicting us and teaching us and showing us uh, in the way that we should go. Uh, again, so if, as Matt said, if somebody was in Islam or Buddhism or Taoism and, and they turned to the Lord in faith, they would receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would convict them and teach them, leading them out of the falsehood and ignorance. The Lord would lead them out of these pagan worship practices and beliefs. Can, can I, I want to make that very, very clear for people who may be listening to this, trying to like pick us apart. Nobody, we are not saying that someone can be saved through Islam, through Buddhism, through whatever else. Other religions are fake. If someone is, is pursuing Islam, and they stay with Islam, and they claim to be a, uh, a follower of God, they're lying. They, the Holy Spirit will draw a person out. Uh, we are not saying all roads lead to God. Uh, I've heard someone say all roads do lead to God, but uh, only one of them, through Christ, is is a good road to take. <laughs> the rest of them are, are in judgment. Um, and that's true, but we are, Matt, this is so not a pluralistic thing that we're saying. It's, he draws right. them out. Now, is this an instantaneous drawing out, Matt? Um, I, I think it would be somewhat instantaneous conviction of the truth, but what, mm -hmm. how, how long it takes. For I'm that saying person like, to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I mean. So like if somebody were in Tao, oh, well, if somebody were, uh, first century, uh, Jew <laughs> yeah. who, uh, you know, had, had never, they were like Saul of Tarsus, for instance, uh, who, uh, had a zeal, but, uh, and, and knew of God, but, you know, had never actually turned his life over to the Lord. He, he was doing it by the flesh through the law, not by faith. Um, when he, uh, actually turned to the Lord in faith and, and submitted himself to the Lord, uh, or any other Jew, we could take Saul out of the question. Uh, does that mean that they're all going to instantaneously stop doing their traditions and their, and their other, uh, ignorant things? Cause did God want them to continue to go to the temple and offer sacrifices? No. No. Did he want them to continue to, to physically circumcise themselves? No. I mean, but we had Jews who still thought that God wanted that. He would, the Lord, we, we absolutely 100% agree, would be convicting them to pull them from that and teaching them all things and, and, and keeping them uh, in. So they weren't ignorant of these things. But kind of like Romans 14 says that some people uh, latch on to these practices and these traditions because they they think it's what the Lord wants. Again, this is they think through their flesh. This is what the Lord wants. Uh, and and Paul says that it's actually because of weakness of their faith that they're doing these things. Right? They're just like, well, I I, I you know I've been raised this way. I think that God wants me to do this, so I'm going to continue to do this. But God is going to lead them and convict them to pull them out of that. Yeah, they they haven't been guided in all truth yet. There, there's a mature right. <laughs> a, a maturation that has to happen, right? Um, right, go grow, as as he says, grow up in the grace and Lord your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or as Paul says about the body of Christ, right? That you know he wants us to grow in that knowledge to equip each other for the works of service, so we are not tossed to and fro from by every wind and doctrine. It's interesting. We we do have actual live examples. So I have some friends who are in the Middle East somewhere, and I'm not going to tell you the names or where they are, but one of them might be listening to this while he's doing the dishes. So uh, what's up, bro? Um, and he is, they have confirmed for me the, some of these stories about people having dreams of, I should say, some Muslims having dreams of Isa, which is another name for Jesus. And they are directed to a missionary or to a church where they can then hear the fullness of the gospel. Um, 
that is what we're trying to say. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, if that, if those people are repenting to the Lord in whatever capacity they can, God sends them the Spirit. They say He sends them a message to draw them out of whatever ignorance they're in, so that they can worship Him in spirit and truth. Right. So, kind of turning this to, so that's where these when, when Paul says, you know, uh, what you worship in ignorance, and I declare to you, you know, God now declares all men everywhere to repent and. He can do that because when you have repented and trusted in God, he can give you a spirit and all these pagan practices that you're doing, all these 3,000 idols, he's going to pull you from that. You can repent of your idolatry because he's now he's now taught all men and he teaches all men everywhere that this is a, a wrong thing to do. Before, only the Jews were really aware of this uh, because they had the Mosaic Law. Uh, it's not an innate, like, <laughs> I don't think idolatry in like the idea of making an idol you know, like the Jews did with the golden calf. Mm -hmm. That was a big clump, as Matt says. <laughs> uh, I don't think that... Uh, I forgot where my thought was going. But anyway. <laughs> you just picture so this big, ugly golden cow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, my, my head saw that image and I lost everything. Uh, so if someone, again, were to turn to the Lord today through the God's universal witness, they would be justified by faith. But the Lord would lead them to the knowledge of Jesus in the New Covenant. That's like that's a God, that's a promise that God has made, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. You know, He promises to instruct sinners in the humble in the way, in Psalm twenty-five eight to nine. He promises that those who fear Him and trust in Him will be instructed in the way they say they should choose. That's Psalm twenty-five twelve, and He will declare to them or proclaim to them His covenant, Psalm twenty-five fourteen. So we believe that God would, uh, if if somebody. Yeah, they came to God, uh, they came to the Lord uh, without understanding Christ yet, without knowing of Jesus, that he would lead them to that. He would instruct them in the way that would, they would go. He would ensure that they didn't sit and stay in ignorance. Right. So <clears throat> one one thing we realized we had to address in this study is the, the idea, it, you could try to take this too far, right, and make some kind of Old Testament universalism argument where, oh, well, God's passing over all ignorance in the Old Testament, and uh, he just accepts all kinds of worship, and and no, it's there's not there's no Old Testament pluralism. It didn't change, and there's no Old Testament universalism. <laughs> uh, a perfect example of this is in Romans 11, which is actually a story about Elijah. Um, Elijah is at this at what Paul is talking about. Elijah is disheartened. He's pleading pleading with God. He's saying, "Look, God, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. I alone am left." Paul was brokenhearted and believed he was the only worshiper left of God. But what was the, as, as Romans 11, 4 says, but what is the divine response to him? I have for myself, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal or Baal, however you want to say that. Um, right. So Billy, the question is for, for you, was worship of Baal okay? No. So it's all worship <laughs> under this times of ignorance? No, absolutely not. Yeah. It, well, go ahead. We, we, uh, yeah, people can, ha just like faith could be in an object that's not God, so can worship. Worship can be uh, directed towards an object or a person or a thing that isn't the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator of all things. Uh, that That is obviously evil. Uh, it, is, it is opposed to God. It's not worship that God would accept. Yeah, th these people are... Anybody who's worshiping Baal or Molech or any of the other gods and they're sacrificing their children, things like that, that that's evil. And people knew not to do it. Uh, as Romans 1 and Romans 2 state, we know who God actually is. He's, he's made sure that nobody has an excuse for not knowing his power, his divine nature. Uh, everybody has the law written on their hearts, convicting them, as, as Billy explained earlier, uh, convicting them of the fact that what they're doing is wrong. So if they continue to do that, uh, then... If they continue to sacrifice their children, they are going to be convicted of that. They should know better than to do that. Now, does that mean uh, – well, uh, let's just be clear about that group of people. They are not worshiping God, period. If you're, if you're sacrificing your kids, if you're having orgies, if you're whatever else, you know that's wrong. It's a, Your conscience is testifying against you in that situation, and you're not, you're not worshiping God. The question is, are there – other ways of worshiping that may not have, that could have been to God, our God, the real God, uh, that weren't appropriate. Well, obviously there was. I mean, the Sumerian woman in John 4 is an example. Um, another example that is uh, from secular history, because it's not mentioned in scripture, uh, is uh, ancient China. I've, I've brought this up before, but they, they, 
there's strong evidence to suggest that they were worshiping God, that they were fearing him, uh, but in a way that wasn't prescribed in scripture. Uh, but it was in a reverent way where they, the, they didn't have any images made of him. They were offering spotless sacrifices uh, as an atonement for the sins of the people. They, they were concerned with what they called the mandate of heaven um, and, and what God expected of them and their leadership. Uh, there's just so much to it. And so could there have been people in, in ancient China who actually were seeking God and groping for him? Absolutely. Were they doing it the wrong way? Absolutely. <laughs> that, that, that wasn't in truth, but they were in spirit seeking him. Um, Matt, in the Old Testament, uh, if a um, uh, Gentile uh, learned of Yahweh and, uh, you know, uh, started following the, the Lord in, in faith, uh, did how did the Jews treat them? <laughs> well, the Jews told them, okay, well, you have to be circumcised. You got to go, go through all this stuff in order to be included in our group. Um, did they did they make that, that Gentile uh, become part of Israel and follow all like 600 and something laws? Yeah. The, the, and, you're talking about the God-fearers, right? The, the people who wanted to convert right. from... Yeah. Right. And, but did, uh, <clears throat> did the law actually say that they were supposed to do that? <laughs> Uh, the law said that there were yeah. certain things that they're supposed to do. Like they could, right. they could, uh, like they like the high priest. Uh, if if a sojourner had joined up with Israel and they were worshiping God, <clears throat> then uh, all of it said that they they were under the atonement of the priest. And <clears throat> the uh, the Jews started saying, "Well, uh, t- in order for us to like hang out with you, you're going to have to start doing all these things because otherwise they considered this Gentile unclean." So they started saying that they had to do all these certain acts, but nowhere in the scripture did did it say that if uh, somebody like started hanging out with, like if a sojourner started following you, <clears throat> that they're supposed to now be under and follow all the Old Testament Mosaic law. But the Jews were required because they had give God had given it to them specifically. Uh, it was their it was their written law, and they had the prophets that they were uh, to to know and to follow, and they were held accountable for that. But the Gentile, who had never been given the Mosaic Law and didn't know the law, were not held accountable. That that we've talked about this many times before about you know ignorance of like your 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 neighbor comes over and <laughs> and they come in and they're wearing you know purple pants and you start beating them senseless because they're wearing purple pants and like why are you doing this? He's like because you're wearing purple pants. He's like I didn't know I wasn't supposed to wear purple pants. And, and we would all think that's unjust, even if uh, <clears throat> even if you're an atheist or any any kind of person, you think that would be unjust if you started beating someone. Uh, for a rule they didn't know of or had any ability to, to actually follow. So now that's how the Jews were in the Old Testament. What about for those of faith in the Old Testament outside of the Jewish nation, they would have had, again, the law written on their hearts and their conscience bearing witness against them. And this is exactly what Paul says in Romans 2, right? There are certain things that a worshiper of God would know not to do because it would have violated their conscience. You know, obviously this would refer to things like sacrificing children, sexual morality, any other sin that would have been have obviously been uh, the wrong way to worship the perfect maker of heaven and earth. They would have had these things uh, written on their hearts and the conscience bearing witness against them. Lying, I mean, that's uh, they, they would have known not to lie. The conscience bearing witness against them. Knowing that they, they shouldn't lust after another woman. That's that's Their conscience would have bear witness against them. So... <clears throat> Bring in a first full circle back to Acts 17. What is the times of ignorance? This is the point prior to Christ. Or the, the, these, this is the times prior to Christ, 4,000 years, give or take, you know, however many, where someone could have been fearing God, seeking him, uh, and, and it, be, having been credited with righteousness through Christ, and yet they were doing it in the incorrect way. And this is, if you, if you look at John, 10 verse 16, Jesus says, uh, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. These sheep, sheep here, idiomatic of followers, th- these other sheep are people outside of Ju- Judaism. They are, they are outside of the Jewish people and they could have very well been just as the Sumerian woman was and the Sumerian people worshiping the incorrect way. That's what the times of ignorance was. God is overlooking the fact that his sheep are worshiping him in the incorrect way. What has changed? Christ 
came, he made the payment for all sins. He purchased humanity. He purchased back our inheritance. He re- he redeemed it. And the spirit was given to anybody who is in Christ, who has seen his family, who is going to participate in the inheritance that Christ bought back. The spirit is sent to them and convicts them and leads them into all truth, including, hey, stop worshiping the way you're doing because it's wrong. Worship this way. <laughs> Worship in spirit and in truth. Don't stop. You don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. You don't have to go through this, these complicated ceremonies. This, that's, that's not, you know, it, it, it's not appropriate. Um, will they, will the spirit definitely guide them to knowledge of Jesus? Possibly not. We can't know that. I mean, there could have been a Native American right after, you know, in the first, second, third century before news of Christ made it across the ocean who was worshiping God. Uh, John in Revelation says that he witnessed before the throne every tribe and tongue and language, nation, etc. Um, that that could have been hyperbolic. He could have just been saying, yeah, it was a lot of people. Uh, but it was pretty specific. And considering this is a revelation to God, uh, to, to John to, to give to us, uh, the fact that he says every tribe and, and tongue and nation seems to imply to me that there's going to be representatives from <clears throat> every tribe and language and nation. So how would that be possible? Well, it's possible if you accept the fact that people in uh, the Native American pr- uh, just after Christ who couldn't have heard about Jesus was still credited with righteousness and was still guided by the Spirit into truth and away from the ignorant way they were worshiping. Yeah, there's, uh, there's. I think we should make a distinction too. There's one thing about um, being ignorant because you're incapable and don't actually have information, you know, uh, and being willingly, willingly ignorant. <laughs> What's the difference between that, Matt? Um, one is that you you just don't know. Like a child doesn't know uh, good and evil. That's we've we've talked about that many times. The other one is kind of like the the end of Romans one or the parable of the sower that you got that first seed. That anybody who rejects the truth, they are they they put their hands over their ears and they go la 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 la, and and they go seek their flesh to the point that they uh, God gives them over to their flesh. And they are, they have been willingly ignorant of what they're supposed to do. They have, they have ignored it. They've pushed it aside. They suppressed the truth. And, it, and it's just, it's taken away. That seed is taken away from them. Um, so the, the two different kinds of ignorance, one of them is on purpose. And that one is when God says, turn that person over to their sins, cut them off from the people. Yeah. Suppressing the truth, uh, as Ephesians 4 says, uh, <clears throat> where is it at? That's a good one about the Gentiles. Uh, control F darken. <coughs> there we go. So I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk, and the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded in the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Well, why is there ignorance in them? Because they, uh, the foolishness of their mind, they've suppressed the truth, being darkened in understanding. They had the light and they, you know, rejected it. That's why there's ignorance. It's willingly ignorant <laughs> instead of not actually having any way to know. Yep. Which willingly ignorant, isn't that another way of saying foolish? Yes. Yeah. De- defiant, mm-hmm. stubborn, hard hearted, <laughs> hard forehead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So anything else you want to add to times of ignorance? I-, I feel like we made it pretty clear. Yep. So this isn't. So what we would just to sum up: it's not about repenting unto salvation. Uh, that's been something that God has declared since the very beginning. Right. It's about repenting from from ignorance, and and we can do that now because we have the Holy Spirit of promise who will teach us all things, and convict us of all things, and lead us in the in the right way that we should go. So if they want to ask us questions to clarify whatever, where should they go? How we're wrong. <laughs> um, they can <laughs> email us at biblebrodown.com. They can find us on our website. Sorry, email us at biblebrodown at gmail.com. Find us on our website at biblebrodown.com. They can find us on our Facebook group, which is same name. We we get lots of questions and great dialogue on that page. Uh, it's a very open page. We uh, don't hate on each other because you have a different belief or view. Uh, we just ask you to be respectful. And, and so far, so good. We've had a lot, lots of great discussions with lots of different opinions and lots of respect thrown at each other. <laughs> yep, yep. If if your goal is to come into the group and start 
heresy blasting. Um, you know, God bless you. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> we're, we're not going to let that kind of thing go on because we, we want to uh, sit at the adult table, right? We want to have mature discussions with people and not name call. And that's okay. All right. Till next time. God bless.